Hi Rocketeers, I'm Charlie Garcia, and in this episode of Liquid Rocket Engines, we're going to be testing out my tank and my main propellant valve. So to get started, we're going to have to make a to-do list, because there's a lot of things I have to get done before we can get to testing the tank and valve assembly that I showed in the intro of this video. First, I have to assemble the entire stack of fittings that's necessary to connect the tanks to the valves and the pressurization system. To do that, I'm going to have to machine a couple of parts for the first time, and then after that, I'm going to have to conduct a test to make sure that all those parts that I just assembled uh, meet requirements and will perform as I expect them to. Once I've leak checked the fitting stack that goes on top of the tanks, I'm then going to have to proof test the tanks. Proof tests allow me to demonstrate that the tanks will be safe at the pressures I intend to operate them, uh, while also doing it in a way that is safer than if I were to just put them straight on the test stand, fill them all the way up with fuel, and then pressurize them up to operating pressure. Finally, I'll be able to hook the entire tank and fittings assembly up to my propellant valves and a control system, and I'll be able to, for the first time, demonstrate propellant flowing from my tanks, through my run valves, through my check valves, and out into what would eventually be the rocket engine. This is a really long list, so let's get started! The design of the spear adapter was really straightforward. I just took the spear that used to be in the keg, I put a pair of calipers on it, and then I pulled the dimensions that were important, and I made a chunk of aluminum into a similar shape. I then went over to the lathe and I turned this up. Uh, I mostly didn't film this, uh, but here you can see the, the finishing up of the part. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just got a little gland for an o-ring. Uh, it's the right diameter. It has a uh, tapped hole for the dash uh, 16 ORB fitting, and then it has these uh, little fins on the side that allow it to uh, drop into the keg connector. Installing this fitting into the tank was a pretty finicky process. There's a little snap ring um, that's actually a double deep snap. Uh, snap ring. Uh, it's the first time I've seen one of these, um, so I put on a pair of leather gloves, grabbed a pair of tweezers and pliers, uh, and a bearing puller to uh, take the preload off of it, and then I just kind of fiddled with it for 20 minutes, and after a whole bunch of swearing, uh, eventually everything was, was seated and assembled. The next really interesting problem I had to solve was this dip tube assembly. Uh, the dip tube allows me to put pressure and gas in the bottom of my tank and have it go to the top of the tank without mixing with the liquid. And I need this for a variety of reasons we'll discuss in a minute, um, but the short version is, is that there's not really a easy, off-the-shelf way to do this assembly. So I was going to have to make some custom parts. So what I ended up doing was taking a Dash 16 AN cap, turning a hole into it that would fit the sleeve for a tube, uh, for a Dash 10 tube. Uh, I'm using Dash 10 size plumbing for my uh, gas lines. And then I welded a Dash 10 B-nut on the back of this Dash 16 cap with a hole in it. And this creates a seal between the Dash 16 piece and the Dash 10 piece so no gas leaks out there, while also allowing me to install this dip tube from the bottom uh, and connect it up to a gas fitting for a um, pressure it system. As an alternative to welding up this fitting stack up, I could have drilled a hole in the top of my tank and I could have welded on a dash 10 AN bung to the top of the tank in stainless steel. The reason I didn't do this is I didn't want to weld on my tanks. I felt much more comfortable welding on these two fittings, uh, where if I damaged them I could just throw them away and start over rather than welding on my tanks. The reason I can't just bubble gas up through the tank uh, without having this dip tube is because the gas can actually dissolve in my propellants, and then my propellants would have uh, dissolved helium or nitrogen in them. Or even worse, uh, for the liquid oxygen, because the liquid oxygen is so cold, it will make the volume of the gas much smaller uh, because of the ideal gas law. Um, and so this means that then I would need much more gas uh, to pressurize my tanks. While that isn't a particularly bad outcome uh, on the test stand side of things, I mean, helium's expensive, but uh, that would be a solvable problem. Uh, if I eventually ever want to get around to putting this on a rocket, I would need to be able to uh, carry as little gas as possible in my uh, pressure vessels uh, to keep the rocket light. This dip tube also serves as my capacitive level sensor. Uh, this is what enables me to tell how much uh, propellant I have in my tanks remaining. Um, so if you go back to episode 7, I believe you can see all about how I uh, have uh, two uh, concentric tubes uh, that are hooked up to a capacitive uh, readout sensor that's hooked up to my data acquisition system to tell me exactly how much propellant is in the tank. And this is important because my cryogenic liquid oxygen is going to be continuously boiling into a gas and being vented uh, by the test stand. And so after a couple of minutes, it'll be hard to know how much propellant I have left in my liquid oxygen tank uh, without either having a weight sensor or uh, a capacitive level sensor or some thermocouple probes to tell where that level is. 
These two fittings that I welded together were made of some unknown alloy steel. Um, I should probably be using stainless steel on the lock side. Uh, I'm planning to buy some stainless steel fittings and, and remake this for the liquid oxygen side of the test stand. Um, but just for this first test, I was using these alloy steel pieces, and they hated being welded together. I have no idea what alloy this is, but this is by far the worst material to weld that I've ever welded. And I've welded aluminum, I've welded titanium, this was just, this was worse than all of it. This was awful. Um, I tried all kinds of different tungstens, I tried different power settings, I tried pulse welding, um, my tungstens were splitting, my tungstens were melting, uh, the uh, steel itself was popping and crackling, it was just awful. So to explain the complete fitting stack up, I've got that custom machine part that adapts my fitting stack to my keg. Then I have a three-way ANT fitting. Uh, this fitting uh, connects uh, the uh, ORB port on the keg uh, adapter uh, to uh, both the main propellant valve as well as the pressurization system. The main propellant valve just has a dash uh, 16AN to NPT adapter. It threads into the main propellant valve. Then the main propellant valve has a dash 16 NPT to NPT uh, union. And then it has a check valve to keep any contaminants from getting back up into my tank or my valve. Um, on the pressurization side, um, this isn't exactly how I'll have this configured on the test stand, um, but I have uh, a dash, uh, I have that uh, dash 16 to dash 10 back-to-back -back B nut uh, that I welded up earlier. Uh, then I have a dash 10 union uh, that connects to a, uh, a dash 10 AN to NPT adapter that connects to a uh, uh, dash 10 to dash 4 NPT reducer that I then threaded in a connection to a uh, nitrogen bottle that I'm using to provide uh, 3,000 PSI pressure uh, for this tank. Uh, then there's a regulator. The regulator takes the pressure from the 3,000 PSI in the bottle uh, down to the 400 PSI that I use for my test. So next I did a hydrostatic proof test of my tank. To do this, I filled everything up with water and it's really important to get all of the bubbles out. Uh, and then I used a pump, a uh, special 3,000 PSI high pressure water pump uh, to pump the tanks up to uh, 600 PSI. This is a safety factor of 1.5 over my planned operating pressure, uh, and this is just to give me some margin. Um, I've seen some people take these tanks to way higher pressure, so you probably should not be standing as close as I am to these tanks when you do it, but because they're filled with water instead of air, there's not a lot of stored energy if the tanks were to rupture. Um, so uh, definitely I would Looking back at this, probably want to have done this from further away, uh, maybe put it in a bathtub and then fill it with water over it, and this would allow me to then uh, contain the energy if the tank were to have failed. Um, but I was pretty sure that the thing that would have failed if it did fail was my custom adapter, and I was pretty sure that was okay. Um, so once I uh, pumped up to a high pressure, I let it sit for 10 minutes to measure the decay and make sure that it wasn't uh, leaking somewhere that I didn't know about. Uh, there was one tiny leak from the o-ring up top. Um, I swapped that o-ring off camera to fix it, um, but it only lost 8 psi uh, over the course of 10 minutes, uh, and since water is an incompressible fluid, uh, that means that really very, very little leaked. Um, so I decided this was an acceptable pass on the test, and I was ready to proceed to my integrated testing. Alright, so I've got a little bit of a mess here of a setup, but uh, we're going to go through it quickly because i got cameras burning. So this is my main propellant tank for both fuel and oxidizer. I've got, uh, this will be symmetrical on both sides of the test stand. I've got a fixture here designed to help support everything. Uh, most everything is temporary installed, which is why there's clamps all over the places instead of screws. I've got a power supply. Uh, I've got a controller and a valve bank here that's all connected up through this uh, mess of one-off wiring. And uh, I've got two valves wired up to my main propellant valve. As well as underneath, I've got a high pressure uh, nitrogen bottle. I'm going to use this nitrogen bottle to pressurize the tank through a dip tube, and that's going to allow me to then uh, vent the contents of the tank and test the actuation speed of the main propellant valve. Um, so uh, this switch here is what controls that main propellant valve, and uh, right now I'm going to start pressing, pressing up the, uh, the tank. I have done a lot of tests to get to this point to get me comfortable with being this close to a tank. Uh, this is really not best practice. Because I'm not using my fanciest regulator and my large composite overwrap pressure vessel for this test, uh, I've had to make some changes to my test configuration. I'm starting with the tank partially full. This is allowing for there to be a gas volume on top of the liquid. So what I'm doing is I'm actually transferring pressure from this bottle up to this tank at about 400 psi. 
Then when I open it, that gas is going to expand. And while I'll still be adding some pressure from this gas bottle, um, it won't be very much because this regulator is pretty undersized for what I'm trying to do here. I've got the valve closed, uh, the check valve is clean, uh, I've got the power energized, I've got my tank pressurized up here to 400 PSI. We're going to go ahead and give this a go. Super soaker in three, two, one. Cool. Three, two, one. During this test, there was a few things I wanted to check. First was I wanted to check what my mass flow rate was on the engine. I was able to calculate my mass flow rate during the test at 1.56 kilograms per second at steady state flow. This is awesome because this means that my tanks and valves are large enough to support a 10 kilonewton engine. The current engine I'm designing is only 6 kilonewtons of thrust, so I've got plenty of margin to make this work. The second thing I wanted to check was I wanted to check and make sure uh, that my valves were opening quickly enough to give me consistent repeatable opening times when I'm running my engine. I was able to use a high speed frame rate on my GoPro to measure the opening speed of my valve, and I've measured it at about 90 milliseconds. Uh, this is pretty great result for me. Uh, it gives me a good quick start transient, and so I think that's everything I needed to learn from these tests. Uh, as I go on, I'm going to be running additional tests to continue to incrementally approach the point where I can put an engine on the stand with real propellants. So I'll be documenting that process uh, through more videos. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, Godspeed.